All right, Emmett, thank you for coming on. Appreciate you. you. So, Emmett, um, let's uh, let's hear a little bit about you. Uh, tell us maybe what you've been up to over the last couple of years, and we'll go back and we'll talk about how it all got started. Well, last couple of years has been interesting because of COVID. Um, COVID, I would say, is the catalyst that drove business owners um, to a reckoning to say, mm. you think, I think I'm ready to retire because they went through the 2008-09 recession. Mm -hmm. They hung in there, um, weathered the storm, but then COVID, it was unprecedented, just a surprise. And then so they survived COVID and they got some money from the government, PPP, and then started to run out and they can't hire people. And then they go, I'm 63 years old. It, this is going to be someone else's problem. Yeah, I, so, think, I think we saw that a lot. They call it the great resignation, yeah. right? Where there was all these people that were sort of leaving the economy. Right. Everyone was going, well, where are all the workers? Right. And then you get the books like Quiet Quitting coming out there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's interesting. So that's been what's kept us busy last couple years. Our business owners saying it's time to go take an exit. Yeah, so I, I have some of your, your stats here that you've been a business broker for 20 years, uh, right. buying and selling businesses. Um, you have personally been uh, responsible for 350 businesses uh, transitioning hands. Uh, you interview and pre-screen 1,400 business buyers annually. So you've uh, helped the buying and selling of lots of businesses, uh, probably hundreds of millions of dollars of that. Talk to me about where this all started, because I know you didn't uh, begin as a business broker your career. I thought that was interesting. So I buy a uh, software services company uh, in the 90s. I've always wanted to be a business owner. Mm -hmm. So I was always working for corporate. But then you come up with an idea, you pitch it to your boss, and the next thing you know, it doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. so it's frustrating. So one of the things that uh, I was working for an IBM premier business partner, and um, not all the solutions are IBM. Mm -hmm. And there was a pretty big Fortune 500 company that needed a uh, what we call an open technology solutions. I went up to my CEO. My CEO said, no, we're not going to do that. Um, it, it, it was a pretty good contract, so mm -hmm. I know I needed to take it from... Um, from, you know, I needed to take it somewhere to service that client. And that was the catalyst for me to acquire that company. So, um, finally answered my dream of owning my own business, mm -hmm. purchased a controlling share. Um, but it was not run well, uh, like typical of some small businesses that buyers find out there. They're what I call e-myth by Michael Gerber businesses. Mm -hmm. One of um, the first business books I ever, actually, yeah. I think it was the <clears throat> first book that I ever oh, read on business. It's a great book. Yeah. It's, uh, we just implemented some of those principles, and so we 5 x the company uh, at mm. that time. But then there was a reckoning as well in the technology world with the dot-com mm. uh, world. And that made me look into, do I really want to be in the technology space? Because I'm an accountant. I'm, mm. I'm not a programmer. Mm. So a business solution to me is a business solution. So I had looked at the healthcare space and I said, you know, with the aging baby boomers, we will probably need more healthcare. So I, I incorporated uh, a company, same name, but I added healthcare to it. Mm. And the solution was providing uh, healthcare services. So I was looking to sell the company at that time and not knowing what it's like to sell a company because you get busy running a company, um, I ended up hiring a, a business broker, uh, actually a couple. One of them ended up in a class action litigation lawsuit mm. that we were invited to participate. It was a two-year process. It was an 18-page uh, class action form that I had to fill out. Uh, we won the class action lawsuit. Um, I have a copy of my class and class action lawsuit uh, check from that time. I, I felt like I had a trophy, mm -hmm. but that gave me the catalyst to be in this industry uh, because of what I've seen, how business owners were treated, some of the, if you will, games that business brokers play or would like to play. Mm -hmm. um, it, it was an enlightening process for me to say, I think I can make a better mousetrap and I can provide better service. Let me let me dig into a couple of those points. So you're working at a company, a corporation. So I, I run a franchise of a 
business brokerage. I mean, yeah. way back before oh, oh, you, yes. before yeah. you buy this business. So yeah. you have this contract that's pretty lucrative. Yeah. The company you work for says we don't want to do it. Exactly. Yeah. So instead of you just giving up there, you go out and you acquire a business and bring them that contract. Is I that... yeah, I actually turned that contract to another company mm. that that I ended up acquiring. I got gotcha. you. So so I I did get that that gave a, a head start for that company to start servicing that contract, yeah. and I didn't do any. I didn't violate any ethical laws. I mean, it, it was not covered under my non-compete because I did have a non-compete from mm-hmm. uh, from my employer, and I honored that. Uh, but it was a, a service that they were not going to deliver, mm. so we started providing it with that software services company that I bought. So you bring them this contract that's a, probably a pretty good one. It's and a then, nice one. And then yeah. you say, hey, I want to also own a portion of this business. Is that, that kind of how it works? That was not how it really worked. Okay. Was I was going to get paid a commission. Mm-hmm. But throughout that whole process, just because the relationship had been established with the owner of that company, um, he ran into some challenges. Mm. And uh, once again, he was an e-myth uh, by Michael Gerber Business. And I said, hey, uh, you can make this business better. Uh, we can pursue some additional um, opportunities. Um, what are your thoughts about my buying shares into the company? So that's what led to my uh, buying the controlling interest mm. of the company at that time. And at that time, <clears throat> did you put your own capital up? Did you roll some commissions into it? How did I, that work? I mortgaged the house. So well, I can... okay, because <laughs> I know everyone listening is going to go. Well, he bought this business and he put it, you know, five hundred <laughs> grand from his high-paying, you know, salary <laughs> job into it. That doesn't apply to me, so, right? So I'm kind of just wondering out loud, how could someone who's in a similar situation, which that's mm-hmm. a unique case, right? Yeah. But how could someone potentially uh, look at buying a business, which we'll talk about definitely into the future. Right. And, and the relationship was built. So it would not be, so, I was not someone that came out of the sidewalk and decided to say, hey, I'm going to buy the company. A, a, a rapport and trust had to be established with that owner. Mm-hmm. that I will be able to deliver and be able to help him grow the company. So what year did you uh, purchase those shares? That was 96. Okay. Mm-hmm. So then do you move over and go start working at that company then instantly? I did. I resigned yep. from my employer. Boy, I bet uh, that boss is going, gosh, I should have just taken that contract. <laughs> it, and I did have a non-compete. So, so my uh, former employer asked me to make sure I, I honored my non-compete, which uh, I told them it's, a, it's an open book. Tell me how long you want me to keep keep away from those clients Mm -hmm. and they were very generous uh they were fair they gave me a one-year non-compete so i avoided those customers for one year Mm -hmm. and uh after one year of course it was free game at that time Mm. i'm sure you've seen that they're considering removing uh do not competes federally have you seen this yes i've seen that it's been talked and it it is a concern in my industry because when we do sell a business we're expecting the owner to honor the non-compete when a buyer buys the business well, I want, would you be restricted then from putting that into the terms of the sale? Or is this more like a prenup where, well, we know what the law is, but we're going to supersede that with our agreement? It's still happening today. until So until a, a, a final decision has been made on that, um, I'm selling a business in Zanesville, Ohio right now, a pretty nice business and a non-compete is included in that. Mm-hmm. Because we, we want to make sure it's fair for the buyer that's buying the business, that he lessens the threats. It's always the SWOT analysis, strengths, weakness, and opportunities and threats. And the threat could be the former owner. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Yeah. Okay, so how long were you, you said you 5X the company. Yeah. How did you go about that? Um, Hiring the right people. Um, Just, you know, once again, it was being run as a Michael Gerber e-myth business. Let's just explain what that book is about to people, maybe, because you referenced it a couple of times. Yeah, so I referenced that book because it's it's a great book. It's, you know, I tell people, you don't have to buy that book. It's available in the library. You can borrow it. I always direct business buyers to do that. But the premise on the book are most business owners are not professional business owners. They become a business owner by default. 
but maybe they're a truck driver. And next thing you know, they've grown a logistics company, but they're not professional business owners. So mm-hmm. no accounting systems in place, no um, infrastructure. Uh, they're running it like a lifestyle business. And that's really what most of the businesses that you'll find that business brokers are selling out there. Mm. Uh, they're lifestyle businesses. Uh, there's a lot of room for improvement, just like what happened with me. The person that I acquired the business from was a programmer, but I'm a marketing and accounting uh, mm. and a finance person. So the first thing I did was acquire a secure a $400,000 credit line, which allowed us to hire more people, establish a marketing uh, sales group, and actually pursue some enterprise larger customers, mm. work on our branding. Brand is important. Your logo is important. Your slogan is Im- important. In fact, our slogan was sharing the power of technology was our slogan. So you go to an enterprise company that at that time in the 90s uh, was it's so dire to get competent technology help. Mm-hmm. Um, you get that slogan in there and the CIOs or the managers or the purchasing people will start listening to you. Mm. That's, so. that's amazing. So how long was the time period that you were uh, involved in this company from start until the final finish and then we'll definitely talk about this class action lawsuit because <laughs> I, I want to <laughs> dig into that. So we, we um, um, so 96 and my closing date to sell was April 2003. Not that long of a period of time, yeah, you not know, long. overall. And once again, you know, the catalyst to that was I saw an opportunity in healthcare. And then you are faced with the dot-com boom, which which concerned me mm-hmm. uh, because that affected the technology industry at mm-hmm. that time. So it made the reckoning for me to say, do I want to switch uh, industries, which I, I started looking into in the healthcare space seriously. But I could not run a healthcare company and a technology company at the same time. Well, presumably it wasn't the dot com boom that got you scared. It was the dot com burst, burst, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the boom is great. Yeah. You know, I'm sure the that was, was hey, you know, we're on a rocket ship. This is awesome. And we also had the Y two K. So right. we had uh, you know people that were programming in mainframe that were very important to some of the enterprise because of the fear of the Y two K. But after all that. Um, you know, we had the dot com bust and the Y two K wind down, and revenues were not as uh, as strong uh, mm-hmm. at that time. So it it was either I stay in for the long haul, kind of grind it out, grind it out, and do another second or third stage of um, energy to get it to the next phase, or move on to the to the next interesting thing, if you will. We're, we're entrepreneurs. We you know we get distracted with uh, yeah, the yeah. next the next best thing out there. The problem is that I have no shortage of ideas and I think all of them are good. (laughs) Uh, So you move on to healthcare. Yeah. And how did I understood you say that you have the baby boomers, but there's a lot of industries Mm -hmm. that are attractive. How do you sort of nail down on that one? So I, I joined the uh, chamber. There was a research focus group on what central Ohio will need uh, within a 10, uh, 10 year uh, time frame, mm. and was healthcare services, so a shortage of nurses. And I'm originally from the Philippines, so my solution on the tech side was recruit Filipinos and international people when we had a shortage in technology workers. Mm. So now I will be implementing similar solution of recruiting healthcare workers from the international um, market. Mm. And the Philippines happens to be one of the uh, the number one importer, if you will, of healthcare workers. Mm. Uh, there's a good number of uh, Filipino nurses there here in the United States. Well, am I correct in saying that uh, in the Philippines, their standards of uh, healthcare education are like ex- just as high, if not higher, than the United States? I, am I hearing that correctly? I would say that in the healthcare and the nursing side. And I know that they like can transition over like a one to one, which isn't true for every country. Well, in the Philippines, they mostly speak English. Mm. So that was my, my programmers were highly sought after because when they came here, they spoke English very well. Mm. And now that's like just the common way of doing tech, like yeah. most tech development uh, outside of like Apple and mm-hmm. those companies is happening in Overseas. India yeah. or it's happening in like Eastern Europe and exactly. places like that. That's exactly. just the way we do it. Yeah. You know? yeah. And one of the number one control uh, 
center um, is in the Philippines today. Mm. There's a lot of virtual assistants. Uh, there's several YouTube videos out there about hiring virtual assistants and getting them from the Philippines. Um, so I, that's the advantage of an English-speaking country. I actually have a guy coming on the podcast who um, him and his wife run a virtual assistant company. <laughs> Because we met him at a podcast expo, yeah. and he was like, I have so many people who their editor is in the virtual setting. Yeah. So yeah. they just send him the clips and the video and everything. They cut it all up. They pull it back and yeah. send it across. I was like, oh, that makes a lot of sense. That's you know? true. That's true. So this healthcare business, tell me about um, what the primary function was and how that kind of grows and, and how life changes with that. So at that time, most hospitals uh, could not hire enough nurses. So the formula, uh, the business model was basically securing nurses from overseas, processing their, it, actually you could not process visa. You have to sponsor their green cards. Okay. Uh, it's, a, it's a lengthy process. So the business model was failed in that regard that, that it, th there's a, quite a bit of time span from recruiting them to bringing them to the United States because of the green card process. Was that just with the Philippines or, or every country? Is the uh, same it, most every country. Well, and, and that was, uh, the, the, you know, that was a failing on my part. I had uh, hundred the impression on the tech side where I can bring someone in in three months. Mm. On, the, on the nursing and healthcare side, there's a little bit more scrutiny. They need to be able to speak English really well because you're in your critical operation room. When someone's asking for a scalpel, you don't want to give them a scissor mm. because it's critical. So they have to go to uh, training school in English. Even though they speak English already, they have to pass some of these English classes. So it takes about 18 months to bring someone from overseas to the United States processing their green card. Mm, that's quite a bit longer than three that's, months. That's it, that makes it, not to say impossible for a business, but much more unlikely that they utilize that as and, a solution. And much more intensive capital, because you actually have to shell out about $12,000 mm. up front. In my, in my tech days, it costs about $1,800 to bring someone in. Mm. in the, on the Philippine side, it costs about uh, ten dollars to $12,000 to bring someone in. So five nurses will equal to about 60 grand in bringing them here. Right. So. And I don't know what uh, people were hiring these technologists at, but if it was higher than the cost of a nurse, then you start to run this margin analysis as the hirer. Most recruiters take 20% of a yearly salary mm -hmm. of the person you right. hire. Right. So that's getting to the point where it's like, geez, how much margin do I have left? <laughs> you know, right? And we did bring someone in. Unfortunately, the clients that we had, we have like, uh, we call it a conversion contract that they can exercise hiring them directly instead of hiring them through us. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're in a staffing formula. So the, the first recruit that we had, uh, we had a, a client that hired them permanently. So we lost that revenue stream. Mm -hmm. So, so it's a, it, it, you know, you learn. So I, I'd like to say every businesses, business I got into was successful, but that was a failed model, if you will. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I say this often on this podcast that, uh, individual entrepreneurial efforts often fail, but over the course of a career, individual entrepreneurs will rarely fail. Meaning that just as you saw, like this one kind of didn't work out. Okay. I'm just going to keep on going. You know, you're not, you're not in the gutter. Right. Fortunately, like, oh gosh, I never, we don't have debtors prisons any right. longer. You know, you're not getting thrown in jail. Uh, I was just watching this history channel, um, bit and it was about, um, Heinz, the Heinz ketchup. Yeah. Here. And he started a business and he ran out of cash and took a bunch of credit from people and he couldn't pay back like $12,000, which was a pretty big sum at yeah, that point in time. Then. That was hundreds of thousands. Wow. And he went to jail and they like published his name in the papers and oh. everything. It was like this huge, like shameful <laughs> thing for him, but he ends up getting out and starting, you know, the Heinz ketchup company. Yeah. So it works out for him, but it's just hilarious <laughs> kind of to think like, well, that doesn't happen anymore. Right. Nobody's going to jail for not being able to pay off their debts anymore, right. which is probably the right thing, you know? Um, right. But okay. So, uh, so that business isn't quite, you know, uh, what you want it to end up being. But the first business that you had, you did end up selling. And that was your first interaction right. with right. business brokers. Yeah. So kind of take me through that process as you begin to lead up to sale of that company. What happens during the sale courting process? And then what happens post with your business broker? 
If I take a look at back to what happened with me, I think this is where a business owner should do their own due diligence. Um, they should be careful who they align themselves with when it comes to selling the business. Uh, there is no regulatory oversight for business brokerage. Hmm. Anyone could be a business broker today in the um, United States. I could be a business broker. You can have a business card tomorrow. I don't. I don't need a license or anything? No licensing. In fact, there's only 14 states in the United States that require licensing if you are going to get involved with business brokerage. Mm -hmm. We're not covered under SEC, the Securities Exchange. Um, anyone could could really be a technically be a business broker. I got you. So unless you're working for someone that has really the track record, and that was the challenge I had, um, you know, nothing against other professions, but I found out that the business broker that I engage with was number one, new in the business, really did not even specialize in the tech industry. Mm. Um, and I did all the wrong things in selling a business, you know, which is number one, I didn't hmm. do my due diligence. You don't know what you don't know. Yeah, You exactly. never sold a business before. Yeah. Most yes, people but, haven't, and most people will only do that ever one time exactly. if they yeah. ever sell a business. Yes. Yeah. But I was, I was not mindful of the contracts I was signing. And looking back today, it was a, it was a whole, um, dog and pony show, the whole process of attending a a seminar and being told what our business is worth and then let, later on being told was really not worth that. Mm, they start and chopping it down exactly. little by little, throw and that, a big number at you. Exactly, and not providing that kind of attention that's needed to take a business confidentially mm. to as well. Um, so those are the kind of things uh, that, if you will, when you take a look at the class action lawsuit, the company that I ended up um, working with that was involved with the class action lawsuit, we found out that they were really not selling a lot of businesses. They were making money out of just doing business valuation. Interesting. So they do a thousand of these business valuation at 37,000 mm. each business. They were making money on business valuation, not really on. So that was the whole premise of the class action lawsuit, that there was a, uh, a systematic way they bring in unsuspecting business owners, getting them signed up to buy a, a very expensive business valuation mm -hmm. with the pretense that they will take them into market. And they'll re remove that cost once they sell it. Exactly. That will just, yeah. but that's gone once you sell the business. Yeah, exactly. Makes sense. Not bad. Um, that's not bad. <laughs> Not a bad little, you and, know, and, thing. and some of those business brokers are still out there, mm -hmm. you know, with, uh, and that's why I tell people, do your due diligence. Um, mm -hmm. It's so easy today to look up someone on the county website, what kind of lawsuits, you know, someone has. Mm -hmm. uh, and once again, like I said, there's no regulatory oversight with business brokers today. I mean, I, I run Ohio Business Brokers Association, and I can tell you most of my business brokers do not have any lawsuits that's pending against them. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, there are um, business brokers that have out there that have some litigation claims to them. But that may not necessarily mean you're a bad business broker. Yeah. You go along you go along long enough, you sell enough businesses, yeah. somebody's gonna yeah. sue you. Yeah. You know, yeah. I just heard someone saying like uh, they were a pretty successful entrepreneur mm -hmm. and they were um, listening to uh, Elon Musk and Elon Musk was saying at any given time we have hundreds and maybe even thousands of lawsuits against oh, us at Tesla. Yeah. yeah. And he's yeah. like, your first lawsuit, it's gonna sting, yeah. but that's part of the process. Yeah. And this entrepreneur was getting sued, so he was like Oh, okay. It's like maybe this process. isn't the worst thing in the world. Now you don't want to have a bunch of a bunch of people suing you. You may yeah. have to look inside if that's the case. But uh, right, it's interesting. So, do you think it's a good thing or a bad thing for the industry that there's no like uh, cross the board license for a business broker? Um, I think it's not good for the industry not to have any licensing. I mm -hmm. think the I think we should have some kind of regulatory oversight. Uh, like in my case, we have errors in emissions insurance, mm. you know, for the protection of clients. It, if you're not licensed and there's no requirement, why buy and pay for errors in emissions insurance? Mm. We do, you know, to make sure that we're doing the right thing for our clients. Mm. Um, if something does go wrong, that's, that's what errors in emissions insurance is there for. Um, so my, my feedback, my, my, but it, it will take a lot of work to get to that level mm -hmm. uh, today because that's the question is, would the government even want to take a look at our industry, mm -hmm. which we, we're, we're in a niche aspect of what we do. Makes sense. You know, we're not accountants. 
We're not real estate people in, in central Ohio. There's about 8,000 licensed real estate people. In central Ohio, there's probably only, I would say, eight business brokers are really. Mm. Uh, so we're not, you know, there's there's not a lot of people like us to that's, do it. That's interesting. Yeah, I'm always hesitant to, to get the government involved and add in additional layers of difficulty in doing any business. Mm. But I also do see the flip side. Um, I owned and operated a uh, small general construction company that was mostly in residential roofing. And what we found, there was no license to be a roofer. So mm. you're outside of the home. Most of the time, you don't even actually need to pull a permit because oh, really? you're not changing the structure of the home, like mm-hmm. the actual like rafters, yeah. things like that. So what we found was that because there's no license, a lot of people get into the industry without necessarily having to like be vetted at any capacity. And you'd probably knock out like a third of the people involved if they just had to go through like even a basic level of like pay a $300 fee to get your license and take like a three page test. Like a third of the people probably just wouldn't do it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So because of that, it kind of really made the industry, um, worse in that there was far too many people involved in the industry, which it doesn't sound like that's true of business brokers. Yeah. Um, but within that far too many prices were too artificially low because a lot of people who would not be in business for very long were coming in and undercutting you, which I guess you could say that's good for the consumer, but also if, if a business is not going to be in business for very long mm-hmm. and they're giving you a 25 year warranty on something, not good for the customer at that regard. Right. Um, yeah. So that was an interesting thing where I went, well, this doesn't have any regulation, but maybe it should have like at least a little bit yeah. of regulation. <laughs> you know, you have to have a license to cut hair. It's like, well, why, well, why is there a license for that? But not to, you know, remove 25,000 pounds of weight from right. someone's yeah. house and then replace it. And people are, you know, 40 feet in the air on a two story roof. Like yeah. there's no license to do this. <laughs> so it was interesting. And I, and I kind of go back and forth on that. Um, so you get involved in their class action lawsuit. Did they they sell your business then? No, they never did. Oh, so, okay. So that, uh, that's why I'm working still today. <laughs> yeah, I, I got you. I got you. I tell people if I did it right, I wouldn't be here today talking yeah, to you. Well, <laughs> so that's why I tell business owners. <laughs> that's good. That's good. Learn from my mistakes. So after the healthcare company, um, is that when you decide to become a business broker? Yeah, because I, a, a congressman sponsored a trip for me to the Philippines to talk to the consulate. Mm. And the consulate um, that I met says, basically threw the book at me. It says, you are not going to bypass the process just because your congressman sponsored a a meeting here. So I traveled 18 hours to do this meeting. He threw the book at me. And then on the way flight back, the book that I was reading are the different visas you can bring people in. So my catalyst to getting into business brokers too was as well as I ran into the E2 visa. If someone from in the international community, as long as they're part of the E2 treaty, they can buy a business in the United States. Oh. So that kind of gave me the idea to say, oh, I can sell businesses to people from other countries because, you know, I- I'm a U.S. citizen and I know how valuable it was for me to be able to come to the United States, how in a way sacred it was. And I know that it's important for other people to as well to be able to come to the United States in the legal uh, form way, and I found the E2 visa as a as a um, an avenue for someone to be able to be legalized to come to the United States. They don't become citizens, but they're allowed to come to the United States if they buy a business and put what they call investment at risk in buying the business and make commitments that they will grow the company with additional employment with their investment. I was going to ask, what are the legitimacy factors that go into that? Because I was thinking, well, your nurses could go buy, you know, a $50 business. It's done up on paper, right? Yeah. Um, what are the standards that uh, an E2 visa for someone, for, and are they still very similar today? Yeah, well, the, the laws have changed. Okay. And, and, you know, I go into this business thinking I would sell a lot uh, of businesses to foreign investors. And I find out, well, there's enough work here in the in the local United States for mm-hmm. buyers here. So 
back then when I when I was working at it, it 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 was a pretty steep requirements. They need to be able to bring in at least half a million dollars. And that's a pretty big investment. Business. Unless they go to like Jackson, Ohio. I know there was some cutout in certain parts of Ohio that if they put in investments of let's say one hundred fifty thousand dollars, that they could actually uh, get an E two visa for some of the the areas um, in low economic area mm -hmm. that will help spur that investment that they're bringing in. Mm. So the international side of the business never really takes off, but you see this E2 visa and you go, oh, okay, maybe yeah. I could start to sell some businesses and use this as a way to uh, um, increase the connection you have back mm -hmm. to potentially the Philippines or anywhere in the and, world. Anywhere, for that yeah, matter. exactly, yeah. And then so uh, coming back from that nursing trip, I researched how to become a business broker. I looked at franchises, and I'm part of a franchise of a business brokerage, mm. and uh, I did my due diligence, make sure it's not the same type of uh, brokerage that I ended up uh, getting part in that class action lawsuit. And so I'm in my 20-year term of that franchise agreement, and they provided the training and the support and the infrastructure for me to be able to do what I do. And then I joined the International Business Brokers Association. Mm -hmm. um, probably, it. Yeah, so one of the largest uh, uh, business brokerage associations. So when I do refer other clients in other states, I'd like to make sure that they are a member of IBBA and that they have the certification that IBBA provides for business brokers. You know, <clears throat> you say us entrepreneurs, we, you know, like to jump from one thing to the next. I am just now remembering when you say the IBBA um, that I looked at becoming a business broker at one yeah. point in time. I've looked at everything. Like I thought for a while I would go back and get my accounting degree yeah. and just be like a non-working accountant. Yeah. Um, I looked at going to law school uh, after college. I have came close to getting my real estate license. I actually started the classes to get my investment license. Oh, so I've wow. looked at basically every, <laughs> you know, one of these avenues and angles, yeah. and I haven't completed any of those. Um, but I did start a podcast, so here we are, you know, making, hey, you, that's know, great. <laughs> you know, making all sorts of stacks of cash with that instead. Yeah. Oh, right? That's awesome. Uh, yeah, that's Okay, so you become a business broker. So that's kind of your next step in your career path. Mm -hmm. um, but presumably on day one, you know, you don't have any clients. No one knows you. You haven't ever sold a business. Yeah. So what does that process look like as you begin to actually get serious about trying to, to buy and sell some businesses? So one of the advantages I had is having been a former business owner before, and my company was a former uh, three-year fast 50 company. So you, you build a relationship with peer CEOs, with other business owners. And from that vantage point, it was, I wouldn't say it's easy, but it was allowable to get referrals from people you've worked with in the past. Mm. I had banking partners that, uh, vendors that sold to me when I was running the company that I went back to, uh, to the well and say, hey, I'm doing this now. Uh, help me um, with the relationship I need to establish in this industry. And uh, basically clients um, came, I talked to people, and one of the things that I did is providing a lot of education to business owners on how to sell their businesses confidentially. So did a lot of workshop, lunch and learns, and from that vantage point, that's where basically I got most of my uh, initial clients is are through referrals, through my lunch and learns, and through my uh, learning sessions. Because, you know, once again, you, you can't go to college or go to someone for free and be educated in how to sell a business. Mm -hmm. So that's the content I provided out there is, let me tell you from the, my vantage of a former business owner, how you can possibly sell your business confidentially. Mm. So as a business broker, uh, how are you making money? Is it similar to a real estate agent? Is there a broker on both sides? They both make a cut? How does that generally yeah, work? Business brokers, is, it's a little different. So it's not really, it's not similar to real estate where you have a, a, a co-brokering relationship. I mean, I do co-broke uh, other uh businesses that mm -hmm. are open. My, my owners would have to be open to it. But most of the time when I take these businesses for sale, it's a confidential sale. Their employees, employees are not aware of it. The vendors are not aware of it. Customers are not aware of it. And then for the most part, for small businesses, it's best to keep it that way. In fact, the uh, business that I have in Zanesville, Ohio, I 
right before the meeting here, we were doing a, a call with a buyer who's moving from Virginia to buy this business in Saintsville. The seller asked me, well, when do I finally tell the employees? As in most cases for these small businesses, anywhere from between a million to 10 million in sales, is best to tell your employees after the sale mm. because you don't want the employees. Most often those employees are going to be needed by that buyer mm -hmm. that's going to take over and you don't want the employees worrying about um, employment and where they will be and what type of uh, uh, employment situation they'll have. Um, so in terms of, um, um, uh, uh, I think the question was, uh, you know, how, you, how, how do you make money? <laughs> how we make money. Yeah. So we get paid uh, based on a success fee. So there's an initial retainer, and that basically covers the the, the reporting that we do, the analysis, uh, basically looking at uh, the business. Are they groomed to actually go to business? Mm -hmm. There are businesses that are not ready to go to market. Mm -hmm. uh, because I know of a business that uh, talked to me uh, right before Christmas, and the, way, the condition, the financials, it it's not ready uh, for prime time at this point. But we get paid at the closing, similar to a real estate closing. Mm -hmm. um, and um, and in most cases, all these transactions are confidential. So the buyers are not able to talk to the employees until we actually get the uh, transaction done. Um, <clears throat> okay, so a success fee. And you said there's no co-brokering relationship. So... You, you presumably are on one side of the coin. Are you mostly starting with the business that is looking to be sold? Yeah, I'm starting not, with it. Not starting with a buyer who comes to you and says, I mean, I'm looking for a manufacturing company in Toledo that makes lead pipe. Fittings. There are, um, and I mentioned to you that, that um, dumpster refurbishing business. Uh, that's in a rare occasion. If it's someone that we know will take on what we call a buyer engagement. It's someone that we've had a history of buying businesses and that has a, a relationship with us to do what we call a buyer engagement. But today, most of my work particularly for, for what we do in the office, is mostly seller representation. Mm -hmm. And buyers come to us. And then will the uh, business seller know much about the business buyer previous? Because I know you, you confidentiality is really important for you. Will they know much about the person who's going to come in and purchase the company? Because presumably a lot of people want to uh, know that the business is going to be in competent, mm -hmm. confident hands after. I think that's where the art comes into what we do. When we sell these small businesses, I tell buyers that there has to be a good chemistry mm -hmm. between buyers and sellers because it's not an investment grade type business. You're not just buying stock. Um, you're buying something that you're going to be operating yourself for 50 hours. Um, just like that, that example I shared with that business in Zanesville, the owner feels that the buyer is a younger version of himself. Mm. He's 68 years old. He really gets along well with this buyer. We've had other buyers look at this business and he's turned them down because they were what we call institutional buyers. Mm -hmm. He says, I'm concerned about how they're going to treat my employees. I've had this business for 35 years. I want my employees well taken care of. Mm -hmm. And the relationship with this particular transaction, the seller is going to stay for about a year to help transition this buyer to mm -hmm. this business. Mm, interesting. So you said that uh, some businesses aren't ready for prime time. I would probably assume almost every business is not ready for prime time because <laughs> most businesses aren't even like able to be yeah. sold, right? <laughs> most people would be like, uh, uh, I will let you pay me to take this business over, <laughs> right? Um, but what are some of the key criteria uh, for a business to work towards, and let's not say in the next three months, let's say you're starting a business and you want to eventually uh, sell the company. I have this kind of funny story that I've told many times before, and it's kind of just like about naivete of being a business owner. Yeah. I was uh, doing some consulting for my alma mater where I went back and talked to some students who had like this business idea, and they had kind of a cool idea. It was a tape, I can speak on it publicly because yeah. this was many years ago and they didn't do it. And it's a good idea. You know, someone could probably have success with it. They wanted to take a tape uh, that boxes would be taped up with. So we have plenty of cardboard boxes in here. And they wanted to do like co-branding on the tape. So if you're selling like a workout supplement, they wanted to put tape on it that was like maybe workout fitness gear. And it would be like uh, co-branded. 
so that the let's say the supplement company is shipping the box out the apparel company would pay for the tape purchase it sort of for them as Mm -hmm. like an ad if you will Uh and then cover the cost of putting it onto the box so it's like co-branding i was like that's that's kind of cool kind of cool idea yes yeah um and i told him well our company ships a lot of product so i know approximately what the cost of tape is and i as the company shipping these boxes out i'm not going to pay more money for tape, right? I'm going to pay less money, but I'm not going to pay more money for tape. So we're going to need to drive this cost of tape down for this to make any sort of sense. And I said, probably what we'll need to start doing is manufacturing. Cause if we're buying from, you know, China and then it's shipping all the way over here and you know, that's a long lead time and these companies don't want to wait. Like we should probably just start manufacturing this ourselves. It's tape. Yeah. It's not that crazy difficult. We could do it. Uh, let's manufacture here. And this kid goes, Hmm. Well, I was really just thinking about selling the company before we ever get to manufacturing it ourselves. I was like, you don't have a name for this product yet. Like, let's put sale, selling the company on the back burner okay. for right now. Let's actually incorporate this company. You have an idea, but you've already mentally sold it yeah. like three years from now. Like, let's get our head out of the clouds right now. Like, I hope that that occurs. You know, I hope you, you know, build a gangbuster business and it sells in three years, but I haven't seen it done. <laughs> and I've been around the block once or twice. So I just tell that story to say a lot of people are pretty naive about what a sell- selling a business is actually like. So maybe if you're either starting a business, you've already started the business, or you're a little bit down the road, what does uh, the preparatory steps look like or the building blocks to build a business that's capable of selling look like? Yeah. So, you know, most often I get phone calls of mm-hmm. people that really, like you said, really just an idea. Or they have a little bit of revenue from somewhere. And they say, oh, if someone took over my business, this could be, you know, growing quite a bit or so. And, I, and, and of course, unrealistic expectation mm-hmm. uh, on the price. But as far as business, so we mostly represent businesses that have been around for at least three years. So we're always looking for three years worth of financials. Uh, because it's, you know, one of the toughest things to, to really do is sell a business. Uh, because I, you know, tomorrow I'm holding the Ohio Business Brokers Association luncheon and I have a slide. And and one of the things I, I talk about in the slide is, you know, we have one of the most difficult things to, to sell. Because number one, a buyer has to buy risk and they have to buy air and they actually have to buy work. So those components are are what makes things difficult. If you can make the risk, if you can mitigate the risk of the revenue, um, you 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 have a good business. If you can um, make the, uh, work on the financials, uh, groom it, you know, where someone could actually see that there's reality to the business model, that's helpful. If you can actually remove your, yourself from running it on a day-to-day basis, mm. it increases the value of your business. Mm-hmm. If you can develop a recurring revenue where you have ongoing revenue where you don't have to sell all the time, it makes the, the business valuable. So those are the kind of things that we start having discussions with a business owner when they come talk to us. Because once again, most common common seller will come to us and it's a lifestyle business. They've been assembling something over the years with a family and now they want to take it out to the market and they have unrealistic expectation. Mm -hmm. That's part of our role in this process is actually provide an opinion of sale value for them Mm -hmm. because we have reports after reports of what businesses sell for out there. Mm. Yeah, you you hit on some really important points there. You have these lifestyle businesses and the E-Myth, they talk about it like, the plumber looks at his boss, thinks his boss is an idiot and goes, he's, this guy's stealing 40% of every sale that I get. I could start my own business. I'm already selling $400,000 worth of plumbing every year and I'm less that 40%. So I'll, you know, make an extra 160 <laughs> grand. So let me go start my business. I'll be making 200 yeah. grand a year. Well, they go and they start the business. Even if they do the same amount of sales, they realize very quickly, like, oh, I don't get a pocket all this stuff. Actually, like, wait a minute, I'm losing money. Yeah, because they have be- to pay for marketing. Yeah, and, and because they're, you know, a plumber by trade, mm-hmm. they know a ton about that. And they go, this is what I want to do. I want to do the plumbing. Like, I don't want to do bookkeeping. That's right. not what I yeah. want to do. Yeah. But yeah. those are sort of the nuts and bolts of what actually make a business work. Yeah. And some of the businesses that we interact with, and I'm, I'm sure you can speak to no end about this, they just lack so many basic financial controls 
That's true. That people just have kind of no idea financially what's happening in their business. Right. And I totally understand that the human mind is not really well adapted to large, complex pieces of data. Mm -hmm. So if you're, you know, looking at, you know, 5,000 transactions that happened over a month and you're trying to categorize them and look at where they all fall, most people are just not adapted to do that. Right. Yeah. So you go, well, sales are up and it's like, okay, well, what does that mean? Like, (laughs) can you quantify that for me? Like, is profit up? Well, no, profit's not up right now. It's down right now. Okay. Well, why? You know, that's difficult for people uh, to kind of get their head around. Right, right. Yeah. And then the second thing you kind of hit on is that financial uh, reporting. And uh, what I tell people all the time is like, if you want to make your business like ready for sale, have a profitable business. Yeah. Like <laughs> just even if you're modestly profitable, yeah. that's going to paint such a better picture for someone than like something that's bleeding money. And to your point, I'm sure you see this all the time. <laughs> You have a restaurant or company or whatever that's losing $160,000 this year, $140,000 the next year, $85,000 the third year, and they go, well, yeah, if you could just do X, then this business would be perfect. I need right. someone to pay me three hundred grand for this. It's like, <sighs> like, I love your optimism, but I just don't see a way that you right. can connect those dots. Well, right. no, no, no. All it needs to do is get... You know, a little bit of marketing out right. there, and, yeah. and I'm sure you deal with that yeah. every single day. So I'm not telling you anything that you haven't heard. Well, the interesting thing is I did sell a business where $40,000 worth of swimming pool was built through the business. It was a material handling business. And, of course, the seller, you know, that was that was money that the seller could have taken themselves, but they wanted to mitigate taxes, unfortunately. And he's probably listening to this podcast, but he <laughs> he had $40,000 worth of swimming pool built in his backyard. Oh. Uh, so... But so the financials don't look well, but it it really was a good looking business if you really booked all the the, you know, the revenues and and the expenses accordingly. Mm. So some some base level financial reporting mm-hmm. really right. important for a business. It is not only you know having the reporting is one thing, uh, yeah. making your business profitable is another thing. Right. <laughs> yeah. So you know those two things I presume would be extremely valuable it for is. the potential sale of your business. Yeah. What about an unprofitable business? What's it like selling that? Oh, that's uh, I try to avoid them uh, because it, once again, it's already hard to sell a business. But have we s- represented them in my twenty years? There have been, and the buyers that find them attractive are well. Number one, they're getting it for the cheap. Yes, but they are buying some kind of asset. They're buying some kind of intellectual capital um. out of it. And just like the business that we talked about earlier, the e-commerce business. Look how much that has grown quite a bit. It had uh, the right product. It had the right audience, especially after COVID. Um, they blew up business-wise, and it became profitable. But from the looks of it, it was it was not that profitable. But mm. the right under the circumstances of the right buyer, that business could be well running. So people are in that situation. They're buying as you stated, some sort of intellectual property, may have, maybe a patent or mm-hmm. maybe a product that kind of works. A history but, or a relationship mm, okay. that they're buying. Yep. And But they're sort of discounting all the other stuff that's it happening. Is. Yeah. Like if you would shave that business, to, I just break even, someone would probably pay more for it. Right. They're yeah. going to say, well, you lost this money last year, so I'm taking that off of the price that I'm right. paying for that right. product. They're trying to just core down on one specific thing exactly. that yeah. someone is selling. Yeah. Okay. What are some of the other things that, uh, as people are along their business journey, need to start thinking about for eventual sale of a company? So I know we did talk about the non-compete earlier, okay. but I, I talk about the three nuns. You know, when a business owner first comes to me and I, I look for the, the, value, the value drivers of the business, mm-hmm. the three nuns, and I used to be Catholic, but I go to Dublin Baptist now. <laughs> but the three nuns is the non-compete, Mm-hmm. Do your employees have that? So if a buyer buys the business, the employees would not just go out there and work for a competitor. Um, non-circumvention. Non-circumvention covers the relationship that they have with the vendors. Okay. Let's say they're getting a preferential uh, treatment on a pricing for a product. If a new owner takes over, would that relationship be circumvented? Okay. And non-solicitation. It's important. So you don't want former employees or the previous owner Mm -hmm. soliciting either employees, products, 
customers or vendors from that. Mm -hmm. So those are the three nuns that I would say help um, increase the value of the business. Um, and is that just something that as you're hiring employees, you put that in the handbook or you put that in some somewhere so that yeah. when every employee kind of signs up to be a part of the company, then they, whether they know it or not, yeah. they've, they've basically agreed to that on right. day one of starting the business. Is that the right. easiest way to make that it's true? A, it's a clause. They, now, we were selling a landscape company um, actually a Plain City landscape company purchased by a company in Cincinnati. Nowhere would I have thought that the buyer would require a non-compete for people that dig soil. But this particular buyer was an institution and they said, well, the only way this deal would break is if we start doing the due diligence and they don't have a non-compete clause mm. to work for another landscape company or what have you. So the seller did come to me and they said, why would I expect my 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 people that plants to sign a non-compete but anyway it was a simple clause the buyer provided a clause for that and it was something that was included in the employee handbook um for the employees to sign off on mm -hmm. that so the employees were aware of it but that made the deal go through because that non-compete was uh, was signed mm -hmm. it's nothing nefarious it's just once again the buyers want to be protected that what they buy is not going to go away mm -hmm. And hypothetically, let's say you're a business owner out there and you haven't done that non-compete yet. Uh, is it something that you could essentially say, oh, like I need to get that done ASAP. I have 12 employees. Let me just get that out to everybody on Monday and say, hey, guys, honestly, like we probably should have done this on day one. But, you know, I'll explain it to you if you really want. But this is kind yeah. of base level stuff. Can you sign these for me? Yeah. And for, uh, uh, using that landscape company as an example, they actually have they actually do a potluck every Thanksgiving. Mm. They gather up all the employees and what have you, and that's basically when they distributed that clause, mm. saying, hey, we're amending our employee handbook, and we just need this to be added in the three-ring binder. And they told everybody, no food until you sign this <laughs> yeah. document. No turkey. <laughs> yeah, don't touch that turkey. The closing happened December 31st, so that, that went through. And, and, you know, everyone survived. It was not nothing uh, bad. Okay, so you want to have positive and good reporting financials. Mm -hmm. When it comes to financials, what are what are the things that business uh, owners potentially need to be thinking about? You know, it's interesting. There's, you know, I always talk about the three types of reporting, compilations, okay. reviews, and audits. Yeah, okay. Most business owners... Small business would not have to audit, but you can have compilations and you can have reviews, which is reviewed by the accountant. Mm -hmm. So I was selling a uh, graphic signage company a couple of years ago. Um, it was doing a small business, about a million dollars a year, but the owner was ready to exit and sell. And he provided financials and they were actually compilations. And okay. I, Which I, is the base level? The Can base you level. just quickly like touch on what those terms mean for people who are out there? Because I only just learned these terms like the last yeah, year, so yeah. probably most people so, aren't, aren't aware. So, so to finish that story, though, the owner George, I said, George, you have compilations because of this. We should be able to get you sold in three months. He said, and I said, why do you have compilations? Because most businesses, I mean, if you look at all the different listings I have today, I do not have any. Businesses, I have compilations. But George looked at me like like I've seen a ghost. He says, why would I not have compilations? Because you don't need to pay extra mm -hmm. for those compilations. But anyway, so compilations is you work with your accounting company. Mm -hmm. They review your financials, and they basically put a statement that it has been reviewed. It's been compiled by the accounting. So there's another level set of a third party an arm's length um, entity mm -hmm. that reviewed your financials. The reviews on a monthly basis, your accountant, once again, a third party, will get a chance to review your financials. Uh, probably pick up some anomalies on your accounting because very common, we're, go, we're going through due diligence. Uh, a buyer will ask, well, how come, and this is the disparity of the financials that we always see. The marketing expense last year is fifty thousand dollars less this year. What? Why? Mm -hmm. If you're having your financials reviewed by your accounting firm, you will not have those disparity. You'll have some uniformity in your financials, mm -hmm. and that's the frustrating thing for buyers when they're buying small businesses. 
if you line by line item with the different category expense, you will find them all over the place, typically for a small business. If your financials are compiled or reviewed, you will have consistency in those financials. It just makes the due diligence go well because that business I kept talking about in Saintsville, we were actually under contract last year already and it failed due diligence the first time. Mm. And so he learned through that process so we have better financials this time. Mm -hmm. So those reviews and compiles and full audits, basically your accountant or, or an accountant you don't work with doesn't really matter. They're coming in and they're putting a stamp on it that, hey, these numbers are real. Right. Alex isn't right. just making these yeah. numbers up. Right. We're going to go in and we're going to verify these. So right. then as the uh, buyer of that new business, you can trust that there has been a uniform way of doing the account. They call it gap accounting, right. generally gap accepted exactly. accounting principles. Exactly, yeah. So they essentially say, hey, we all agree that this is the way we're going to do this. Mm -hmm. We've gone in and we've looked at Alex's business. We know that the numbers he's giving us are legit because mm -hmm. we've gone in and checked the banks. We've done right. all these reviews. We've done a little bit of forensic accounting. Exactly. So yeah. he's not making these numbers up. Right. And they're going to charge you for that, obviously. <laughs> uh, we have to do a review. It's going to yeah. be about 50000 for yeah. our business, um, <clears throat> which as you get to a certain size of business, it just yeah. kind of happens. Yeah. Especially if you have about $10 million in lending is mm -hmm. what I'm starting to understand. Yeah. That yeah. if you have over $10 million, mm -hmm. then the bank is almost legally obligated to do a review yeah. on you. Yeah. I think this was something that passed after the 2008 financial crisis, mm -hmm. where now banks need to go in and actually check on customers that they're lending to and make sure that the numbers they're giving them aren't just totally made up. It's part of your covenant mm -hmm. with the bank. Yeah. Yep. So that is a, a thing that most business owners will never need to do until they either get A, very big, or B, mm -hmm. as you're stating, kind of get ready for a sale of a business. It, and, and that's one of the things that you get value from a really qualified, competent business broker is they're providing a mirror to you to look into your business. Mm -hmm. Because you mentioned a very important word, gap, accounting, generally accepted accounting principles. That's one of the things I ask business owners when in our first meeting, are your financials gap? 95% mm -hmm. of the time, they look at me like, once again, I've seen the ghost. What the heck are you talking about? No, they don't have any gaps. What are you talking about? <laughs> no, we, we account for everything. I mean, well, we account for most things, you know, come on. I build a swimming pool. What are you talking yeah, about? Yeah, well, it's accounted for somewhere. It just might not be under the line item that you would look at, you know? Um, no, I, I think that uh, advice for anyone out there, um, really being a business owner is being, you know, one portion accountant, one por portion CFO, yeah. uh, you know, financial officer, one portion marketing officer, you know, one portion legal, one legal person, officer. yeah, <laughs> therapist for your company's people, you know, only a very, very small amount of business owners get to go out and actually do the thing that they want to do. I just want to go build products, yeah. like, you know, like build your business really big and hire people to do that. They're going to be expensive, exactly. but, but Godspeed in doing it. Most of the time you have to really understand the financial thing. Yeah. And that was fortunately something that one of my uh, pr uh, finance professors when I was in school really hammered into us. Like your first job as a business owner is to watch the cash, like figure that That's out yeah. and then everything else you can kind of figure out on the mm -hmm. side. And that has been super helpful for me because I quickly said, okay, well, I'm going to be our CFO at the company. We had three yeah. people early on. I was like, I'll be CFO. Yeah, good. And good. that helped me a lot. And yeah. then now we've brought in a CFO and I kind of taught and trained yeah. him. And now he's better at it than I was. That's great. So yeah. that's a really helpful thing. Uh, we look at some of our other business. I just heard about a business who, it's a big business. It's not a small business by any means. But they go, yeah, we lost 200 grand last year because the owner was running these sales every um, Saturday and Sunday. They were doing a 40% off sale. <sighs> and then they had affiliates who would also get like 10% or oh, 20%. Wow. So essentially they were running like 60, 50 to 60% yeah. off. It's eroding the margins that way. And they were, they were losing like... <laughs> 20% margin on every sale that they were doing. So they didn't realize this for a year. Oh, wow. So they go, yeah, we had a $200,000 loss last year just on this just, little portion of the business. Wow. And that's something that's quite simple where it's like, hey, if you just have one person who's just like watching some of the things they're doing, they're yeah. going to catch that on month one and be like, wait a minute, we lost like $50,000 on these deals. Like we're not doing this anymore. <laughs> Um, but it's difficult. You know, yeah. I, I get it. As a business owner, you want to sell, you want to do everything. You want to make sure that your business is out there and in people's faces. 
So sometimes these other things, you know, kind of fall by the wayside. Ah, that's, that's amazing. Then. So good financial reporting, good accounting, you know, you're reviewing mm -hmm. what you're doing is actually legit. It's always easier when it comes to accounting to do it right the first time right. than to go back. <laughs> Way less expensive too. So if, if, and when you start your business, you know, do the right accounting things, right. you know, hire a bookkeeper if you need to talk to an accountant before you do it. Um, you got the good reporting, you got a profitable business, hopefully, right? Yeah. Um, what comes next in terms of uh, prepping the business for a sale? Also the non-competes. Yeah, the it's good to have an operations manual. Okay. People don't realize, I mean, what, what's in your head committed to paper. And, you know, I tell business owners in the day-to-day, -day, you know, take, take a look at your time picture for the week. What do you do? Start with that first. Mm -hmm. And then determine what do you actually do for the business. Are you involved with the sales? Are you involved with the operations? Are you involved with the production or assembly? Um, determine that because that's what we're trying to figure out who's going to replace you and what type of person or group will need to replace you. So having an operations manual, um, employee handbook, I would say is important. You would like to be able to provide that new potential new owner a snapshot of how you ran the company. Mm -hmm. Most often the sale will take place as an asset sale versus stock sale. That's one okay. of the things that business owners come to my office and I go ask them, do you know if you're going to do an asset sale or stock sale? Most, 90%, they, they don't even know what we're talking about in that regard. So there's an education process, once again, for that. Stock sale, of course, you know, they could be subject to any litigation um, that might come up uh, on a stock sale. On an asset sale, well, you know, anyone could always sue any anyone, right? But mm -hmm. on an asset sale, they the buyer, the new owner will have more protection in that regard. But employee handbook, I mentioned that um, as part of the potential litigation on asset or stock because I've seen businesses where they maybe have been paying someone in a 1099 mm. and then that 1099 person under a new ownership would say, oh, by the way, I should have been a W-2 and you owe all this withholding taxes and what have you. Mm -hmm. And the new buyers now having to contend to try to resolve that. Most often if it's a asset sale, they're not, they won't be affected to it. So in a stock sale, you are taking possession of the legal entity exactly. and everything that happened previous to this. Previously, exactly. Do you know about the uh, Monsanto story? Uh, yeah. Bayer with, uh, and Monsanto? Yeah, yeah. So we had an environmental historian in and he's talked about this to, to no end, but, um, Bayer acquired Monsanto for, for some enormous billions, multiple mm -hmm. billions, five billions, 10 billion, something crazy yeah. like that. And there were people inside Bayer saying, do not buy Monsanto. There are lawsuits on the way oh, for Monsanto yeah. with uh, Roundup, yeah, um, glycophosphate. And Bayer was like, no, we're fine. Don't worry about that. They have since bought Monsanto um, many years ago, and Isaiah, you could look this up, but I believe that the value now of Bayer is less than what they paid to buy Monsanto wow. because of all these lawsuits, because they did just as you, and these yeah. are big corporations, yeah. so these yeah. are very different from, yeah. you know, any business and they will probably be that we're involved sales with, most, right? Yeah. But, uh, yeah, you can just Google real quick, uh, Isaiah, like, uh, Bayer, Monsanto, loss of value, something along those lines. So they took possession of everything, like all of the assets, wow. all of the liabilities of things that happened previous to this. And because of that, you oh, know, yeah. Wow. yeah, years after Monsanto dealer, Bayer's Roundup bills keep piling up. A Roundup uh, purchased for $63 billion in cash and Bayer's shares have plunged more than 60%. Bayer has lost over 44% of its value since its Monsanto merger. Wow. Uh, it hit a seven-year low in 2019. So they did exactly as you're saying, and they bought everything. They didn't just buy like one asset, which you you probably could have counseled them on that. You know? <laughs> that's a pretty big aspirin to take. <laughs> that, uh, that's a good one, man. <laughs> big um, headache. <laughs> but on an asset sale, essentially, you're not buying that business. You know, you got Joe's LLC that owns this company. You're saying, I don't want Joe's LLC. Yeah. I don't want your potential tax mishaps that you right. have behind you, exactly. your 1099 W-2 issues. Yeah. I'm going to buy your real estate building. I'm going to buy the lawnmower inside of it. I'm going to buy the weed whackers. Mm -hmm. 
I'm going to buy and take over the employees. Um, goodwill. Yep. Goodwill. It's an asset. Things like that. Yeah. Maybe the name that yeah. you even get the mm -hmm. rights to the name exactly. or any yeah. trademarks that mm -hmm. are involved in it. Um, but they're not going to touch anything that happened previously. Is exactly. that kind of a yeah. good summation of it? That's that's a good summation too. Are there any situations where the full uh, sale makes more sense than just the asset sale? Or is it... To do a stock sale? Yeah. Uh, there's actually a, a, a code called 338H where a buyer could buy the uh, business on a stock sale, but it's still treated as an asset sale. Mm. So most, most sellers would like to sell on a, on a stock because of tax implications. So now we're going over on the taxation of the sale. Yeah. Um, what's the most effective way to sell a business is, of course, a stock because the taxation rate is lower than an asset sale. Oh, I see. On an asset sale, they have depreciation recapture. So when you buy a van, you're able to it. depreciate it. Mm -hmm. Well, when you're selling it, there's an appreciation recapture, uh, depreciation recapture on that. Uh, but that 338H, if someone wanted to look it up, that's uh, uh, not too many people talk about that. So I was just um, in a meeting uh, last week with a software company, and they wanted to buy something based on an, a stock sale. Um, the seller wanted to sell on the stock, but the buyer wanted to be able to take advantage of the asset depreciation. So there's a and little that, bit of a headbutt between the buyer and seller because that, one person's going to get the advantage, one person's going to take a little bit of a hit on the tax happened, side yeah. of things. I sold a fitness center in Upper Arlington, and I called it the Texas Hold'em because they could not reconcile the... Um, what we call the allocation of purchase price mm. because the seller wanted to sell most goodwill. The buyer wanted to buy the exercise equipment on an asset value. Mm. And it took, uh, I think we got, we got in contract in November and you know, the busiest time for the fitness is yep. January. January. We didn't close until February. So they missed that because they, they, they eventually came to a compromise, but uh, that was a interesting three month process of, waiting for the buyers and sellers to come to a compromise. Mm. Yeah. Okay, you've got your financial ducks in a row. Uh, you got your non-competes in a row. You got your handbooks, your operational manual. Mm -hmm. I know that's one of the things that E-Myth talks about a lot. He mm -hmm. says, build your business almost like a franchise. It's funny, right. I was just in a restaurant, a new restaurant down the road, but it's a franchise. Mm -hmm. And I could see the employees like thumbing through the manual, <laughs> like trying to, like, like, how do we make this? And I was like, well, that, that's good. That's a good example of what it should look like. There's a right? checklist. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so maybe you've thought a little bit about, you know, what happens on the, the tax side of things. Are there other things to think about in prepping your business for its ability to actually sell? Um, you know, I tell people really the first step is have a good reason to sell. Mm. You know, is it, you know, what, do a good soul searching. Um, because I, I, I do have to tell you, I regretted selling. Mm. Um, there's been times where I said, you know what, I should have hung in there and not sell and kept running that technology company because mm. I wonder today what it could have been. But for me, there was a shiny new toy to look at, which was a failed business model with that nurse staffing. Mm -hmm. um, tech staffing was, was you know, still a, a pretty much a important component today in the, in, the, in the business world today, especially with enterprise needing people to do their programming and outsourcing. Um, so determine what really is the main reason why you want to sell, do a good soul searching for that. And I talked to about 120 business owners annually, and only about maybe 20 to 30 will actually do something, engage with me. Mm -hmm. And the rest, after they meet with me, they would have thought, I'm not ready to sell, and two, I really don't have a good reason to sell. Mm -hmm. They just had a bad day, bad week. Three employees resigned that day, so typically will you know get a phone call on a on a monday because they had a good weekend they come back to a headache or they'll call on a friday because they dread the fact that they have to come back on a monday so i want to sell because i want to be rich Emmett. come on <laughs> I, I want a huge check man i want the check i want to buy the boat i want to buy the house what are you talking yeah. about why am i going to sell the business Obviously, right. I want to be rich. Um, <laughs> right. You know, it's a, it's a, actually an interesting story. I think it was the uh, creator of Minecraft. He sold his business. He worked so hard to get his business ready for that sale. He built this incredible product that people loved. 
and then he sold it to one of the big players out there, something like Microsoft. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Billions, yeah. multiple <laughs> billions, two billion, three billion, something like that. You know, that's payday, yeah. right? Um, and he said for the first, you know, three, six months, he did what he thought everyone would do. You know, he traveled the globe. He bought like Rolex watches and expensive <laughs> clothes. And he went to Ibiza and he went to parties and stayed out late and, you know, bought a, a boat and hung out on it and drank champagne and did that whole thing. He's like, but about like month six, I was like, okay, obviously like that was fun, but I'm done with that. Mm -hmm. And then he starts like, you know, calling his friends like, hey, what are you doing? And they're like, I'm working. Like, <laughs> I'm at my job. Like, I have a nine to five. And he's like, oh, okay. Yeah. He called the next one. I'm working. Like, I can't come hang out with you. Right. And it started to set into him like, dang, like, I had this purpose, this thing that I was living for, mm -hmm. this reason to keep on going. It yeah. was this like future thing. Like, I might be able to sell this business someday, yeah. but I'm building something cool. And then once he did it, he sort of like had this empty feeling, you know, where it's done. I did it. But like, now what? You know, I think they actually have a name for it. I think it's called gold medal syndrome, <laughs> where these people who like win an Olympic gold medal, mm -hmm. there can be like a depression that sets in yeah. after because you go, I did the thing that I always wanted and it was great. It was exciting but my life hasn't changed like I thought it would. I thought everything would be yeah. perfect then. Yeah. I thought my my fulfillment would be done and dusted, but it's like, oh, like I still have bad days. <laughs> like, oh, I still like feel like I have energy in the tank. Like, oh, um, you know, I'm not as happy as I thought that I would be when I had that thing out in the future that maybe I'll hit it, maybe I won't. And now that you've hit it, it's like, well, what now? It's yeah. the journey, yeah. the journey to, to get there. Absolutely. So, yeah. Uh, okay, well, I think those are some great things about uh, actually being able to sell a business. Um, so, as a business broker, um, let's say I'm uh, thinking about buying a business. Mm. What are the things that I could be thinking about and looking at on that side of the coin? That's interesting. Um, most buyers have a misconception of what uh, bis buy sell. I'm an alumni board member for Biz Buy Sell, and mm -hmm. they, um, we have 65,000 businesses for sale on Biz Buy Sell, one of the largest portal for businesses for sale out there. And when you go out there and you're a new business buyer, it's like going into a candy shop. You can't decide what you want to walk mm -hmm. away and take to the cash register. But I tell people, find something that um, I have uh, an acquisition quadrant that figures out the the financial aspect of buying this business. And then one of that quadrant, it says, you will be happy. It's a business that you'll be happy to wake up at 5.30 in the morning and you can't wait to open the door to get there. That's Those are the kind of things that we'd like to determine from a buyer first. Mm. Is this something you're trying to buy based on just on the financials? Or are you interested in the fact that this is e-commerce, like that e-commerce business that we talked about? that you can improve on and you know you could grow. You like the numbers, of course, uh, but then it's something that that makes sense. So when we, when I work with buyers, n number one thing I like to determine is does it make sense for you to buy the business? Do you have the risk tolerance to buy a business? Because I'm approached by about 1,400 buyers annually. In 20, I think it, 2021, we had over 2,000 buyers. So the numbers went up after COVID. Mm. There were a lot of people that wanted to buy a business. And then in 23, it kind of normalized to 18. Um, no, I'm sorry. It, it's, a, it's a little over 1,400 for 2023. Um, in 22, I think there were about um, 1,800 buyers. So one of the things we would like to determine first is do you have the financial risk tolerance to buy a business? And two, what's driving you to buy a business? So I just spoke with a, a buyer today. He's an accountant for a government entity, and he's looking at my material handling business, wants to capitalize on everything that's happening in Ohio today with Intel coming to the area, all the construction. There's a lot of material handling happening, you know, trucks, soil, cement, stone being um, hollered and and he wants to get out of his corporate job mm -hmm. to own his own business 
And I initially looked at his profile because we take a look at where people have come from when they come to uh, seek the businesses we sell. Uh, has mostly worked in a white collar job. So today we had a conference call at 10 o'clock today. I found out that he grew up in a farm and his dad has a construction business. Mm. And the reason he's in a, he's an accountant. Then the reason he's in a white collar job is he went to school for accounting, but he wants to own his own business. He's not afraid to drive a truck. Uh, himself and to run a small business. So that makes sense. So, you know, we're trying to make sure uh, that we have a good story of why someone wants to buy a business. Why would someone like that buy a business instead of trying to build it themselves, start from scratch? Good question. The revenues are there. The The business is generating about 350000 a year for owner earnings is what we call it. So profit, essentially. Profitable, yeah. That's a pretty good, that's pretty good little profitability. Doing a million and a half a year, and the owners are in their 60s. They're ready, they actually would like to move down to Nashville. Nice. Family is down there. They have a daughter down there. Um, the daughter's having a baby. They'd like to be close. So it's got a good reason to sell. And we also have a buyer now that has a good reason to buy. Mm. He's ready to get out of the corporate job and go into running his own business. Just like myself, I was ready to get out of my corporate job and ready to own something that I can control myself and service the type of customers I want to service. So let's say this this example, real world, mm -hmm. good example, uh, $350,000 in profit per year, pro mm -hmm. profit you know, plus or minus, mm -hmm. whatever you want to take, interest, taxes, appreciation, things of that like. How is that business going to, one, be valued? How do you think about multiples, too? And then how is that accountant going to pay for that? Because I have to imagine that's a million-dollar business, I would mm -hmm. think. Yeah, you, know? yeah, you got it. I'm yeah. thinking 3X, yeah. you know. Yeah. I'm no genius yep. in it, but I can multiply by <laughs> oh, three. Oh, wow. You're um, a business broker. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. After today, I might be. Um, yeah. <laughs> so where is that accountant getting a million dollars? I assume he doesn't have that sitting around in his pocket. So the wonderful product that we have to get to sell what I call air because it would mostly good, be goodwill is the SBA product. Small business administration has been a gold mine to allow business buyers to be able to put in somewhere between 10 to 20 percent. Mm -hmm. So this gentleman has saved money. I, you know, I have the, the personal financial statement to say, okay, he's got the risk tolerance to be able to buy a business. We marry that with SBA financing. And if people are not familiar with SBA financing, they really need to go to sba.gov and see that it's a wonderful product to utilize in acquiring a business. And uh, we have several really good banks uh, that could provide SBA financing for, I, I call it qualified buyers. Mm -hmm. If they go to my website, Ohio Business Brokers Association.org, OBBA.org, uh, the SBA lenders are on that website. And um, you can click those links. But so that account will be. Uh, partially borrowing that money. So mm -hmm. uh, for a million dollar business, he'll have to come up with uh, about a hundred to 150,000. And We're doable though, for doable. a successful person, successful a person. million, pretty tough, a hundred thousand doable. And, and there's a, uh, a facility called the Rob's program, rollover business uh, retirement program where someone could utilize for one K funds. Interesting to buy a business without any tax penalty. Interesting. Yeah, it's it's an IRS approved process, primarily strictly for buying a business. Well, then an accountant who's done it for a while, that's very likely yeah. to be possible. Yeah, that, you know? that, that, that is, because uh, uh, very typical, like, like the uh, business that we have in Zanesville, the gentleman moving from Virginia, he's using the ROBS program mm -hmm. to be able to buy a $2.4 million business. Mm. using 401k without any tax penalty. Mm. And he's going to marry that with SBA financing mm. in that regard. And the SBA, just for those listening, the Small Business Administration? Yes, yeah, Small Admin. Business Administration. Um, they are going to be sort of the first lender to step up and say, yeah, we'll let you buy a business. Mm -hmm. Whereas your Chase Banks, your uh, Bank of Americas, mm -hmm. they're going to be like, we don't want to buy a small business, right? Right. Generally. I mean, generally you could get conventional financing, but 20%. You're, you're talking about 30 to oh, really? 50% yeah. down payment. So that's a million dollar, yeah. you know, 
known for that guy, you're talking 300 to 500. Right. That's a lot. And we'd like business buyers to be able to hang on to as much cash as possible. They're going to need it probably. So, yeah. Hang now, on to cash. The SBA generally will be a little more uh, costly with fees and things of that nature. Or not, not really. Not well, in, in previous years, it's been very competitive utilizing SBA. I mean, I, I did an SBA deal and of course the interest rates have gone up. Yeah. But uh, in 21, I, I did an SBA loan for 4%. Um, and it's through one of the major banks in central Ohio, and it provides a 10-year term. So once again, that business acquisition quadrant that I have, we factor that all in in the financial metrics of buying a business. Mm -hmm. So we figure it out based on an SBA formula. So of course, interest rates have gone up, but then interest rates, you know, the, the Fed said in 24, it's gonna go down. So it did affect business sales in 23, um, I don't know how other business brokers would feel about this, but in 23, I could say we probably didn't do as many deals as we did in 22 because of the shock of the interest rates. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think every real estate agent would tell you that yeah. that's true, yeah. you know, across the board. Anything yeah. that there needs to be an interest component attached mm -hmm. to it. I mean, that's that's what yeah. the Fed wanted. They <laughs> wanted things to slow down with interest right. rates. So maybe talk to me about... Um, <clears throat> If I'm a buyer or a seller, how I want to think about what my business is going to be valued at. You said there's a huge disparity in what people think their business is worth versus what someone is out there actually willing to pay. Mm -hmm. um, I talked about multiples. Most people probably don't really understand what a multiple is, but that's all you ever hear about when it comes to selling a business. It seems right. like on my side is what I hear a lot about. Um, how do you assess what a business is actually going to be worth? Well, the beauty of the financial debacle in 2008, uh, in the past, because I've been in the industry for 20 years, we would sell a business without even any appraisal or valuation. But as of January 2009, any business that sells for over 250000 mm. is required by SBA for them to approve it to go through a business valuation process. Mm. It has to be a certain set of standards, what we call NACVA, National Association of Secure, uh, National Association of Certified Valuation. Um, it has to be a NACVA certified valuation, and it gives another check mark for the buyer that they are not overpaying for the business, mm. or if they are, the bank could only lend so much up to that valuation point. Sorry to keep using the real estate analogy, mm -hmm. but I think it's one most people understand. This would be essentially the appraisal by the bank right. to make sure the bank isn't lending you 80% of a house that's not worth nearly it, what they're putting it, in. Exactly, yeah. It's a, it's a third-party arm's length valuation. So it's um, determined by the bank who they use. Uh, it's not an employee of the bank. It's a, you know, it has to be an accounting firm mm -hmm. that's approved by the SBA to actually do business valuation. So that's a, a comfort level for business buyers today mm. that whatever offer, let's say they offer and uh, they they really like the business and want to offer for more than what it's worth, they're going to be hit with reality of what that business is worth mm. through that rigorous process of business valuation. And that's probably part of your job when you're talking to the seller of the business. You go, look, I know you want $2 million for this, but... I know once we go through this appraisal process, mm -hmm. they're going to tell you it's worth a million. Right. So let's like let's save some breath here right. in between time <laughs> and not spin our wheels because even if I find you someone who wants to buy it for two million, they're going to eventually get this report and it's going to say one million. Right. Um, I just heard a real estate agent basically making the same case to people who they want to list their house thirty percent over the most expensive house in their neighborhood. Yeah. They said, well, look, when they pull comps, mm -hmm. they're going to say, hey, the, the best comp is 500 grand. For some reason, your house is at seven. Like, maybe we can get you 520. But, yeah. but essentially, you're going to get turned down by the bank if right. your price that you pay is too high. Right. Unless right. it's an all-cash deal, yeah. you know, or the yeah. buyer just wants to waive that right, right which right. probably doesn't happen crazy. Or, or it's, a, it's an institutional buyer. Mm. So we sold an IT support business close on the, the end of January. It was an, a, a larger IT company that paid all cash for the business. Mm -hmm. No valuation needed. They don't need it because they're acquiring customer assets in that uh, transaction. Mm -hmm. It's still an asset sale, but uh, they're acquiring a good bit of uh, history since 2002 mm -hmm. that the business has been around. So how does someone go about valuing a business, their business, a business for purchase? I know there's 
probably a hundred different ways of doing it, but yeah. there's a couple that are probably more commonly used. Yeah, there's um, actually at the International Business Brokers Association, we issue a quarterly market bulge report. It's very um, exhaustive. If we can make it available for anyone that wants it, it's about 110 pages. Mm. It will go through the different levels of businesses, the size of the business, mm -hmm. what multiples are typical for that type of business. And then we have a 28 page executive report and that's issued on a quarterly basis. Mm -hmm. And once again, a qualified, competent business broker, probably a member of OBPA could provide that to a buyer to say these are the kind of things that's happening. And that's the same mirror and in information we provide to the sellers and saying, hey, listen, tell me what makes you more special than these other businesses that are selling out there for this price. Mm -hmm. So comps, um, your sales are obviously going to play a big role. Mm -hmm. Right. And your profitability is going to play yeah. a big role. And the industry. You know, there are cert certain industries that are pretty, if you will, hot today. Mm -hmm. uh, the SaaS world. Software uh, as a service. Yeah. Software as a service is, there's some pretty good multiples from that area today. Mm -hmm. um, I'm pursuing one today that had been listed before. They were not as profitable, but three years later, they're very profitable. Mm -hmm. I have buyers come with, uh, coming out of the work or one, wanting that SaaS company. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, and um, when it comes to a multiple, a multiple is the amount of profitability that you have in one year. Mm -hmm. multiplied by 1x, 2x, 8x, 5x. even 8x. Yes. Yeah. So how does, that's where the argument comes in, right? Because mm -hmm. your numbers are your numbers. Mm -hmm. We've got the accountant. We've, exactly. we've gone through that. Mm -hmm. Okay, you have, you talked about the example of $350,000 in profit a year. Mm -hmm. Now, how do we decide upon a multiple? I know you said industry makes a difference. Mm -hmm. uh, but what are the factors that goes into that multiple? Because I want eight and the buyer wants Three, yeah, right? so when we go to the analysis, we take a look at the financial, you know, the quality of the financial reporting. How clearly could it be that we could see that it is really at 350 on your financials? Mm -hmm. um, what are your CapEx? So like like the material handling business, in fact, the sellers are not even aware. What is CapEx? The buyers are asking. Well, the capital expenditure, you know, the trucks are expensive. Mm. You know, somewhere between 80 to 150,000, the trucks that they buy. And they wear out, like landscape companies. Mm. You know, there's a significant CapEx for mowers and the equipment that they use because they get beaten up. They get, uh, so those are the kind of things we have to take a look at to say, you know, we also have to take a look at the area. You know, right now in central Ohio, construction related businesses could go for a higher multiple uh, today because of the demand that's happening. And other companies that are coming into um, central Ohio are wanting businesses that could capitalize on that Intel growth today. And not just Intel. I shouldn't just talk about Intel. There's a battery plant, and there's a solar plant, and there's the um, the the space uh, uh, place that's happening at OSU that's being built out there and stuff. I didn't even know about that one. <laughs> so <clears throat> the multiple is going to increase based on being in a good industry, mm -hmm. the quality of your financials, mm -hmm. quality meaning things like mm -hmm. that capex, your profit margin. I mm -hmm. presume is going to have an impact on that. Right. Uh, your return on capital investment, kind of mm -hmm. like that CapEx, right. is mm -hmm. going to have an impact on that. Um, I presume also uh, multiple is going to be affected by how involved the future owner is going to need to be. Exactly. Yeah. It, uh, is, the, is the current owner working 50, 60 hours a week? I mean, because those are the other calculation that someone will say, oh, I make 200000 a year, but they're working 60, 70 hours. Yeah, right. It's that like you're it. making $30 an hour. You're not, <laughs> you're not really doing that great for 60 hours a week, you know, with a business. Right. right. You could make $30 an hour doing something yeah, else. Exactly. 60, yeah. You go work in a factory, get your overtime, dude. Right, exactly. Um, <laughs> yep, that's going to be another Without thing. the risk. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, what are other things that play into that multiple? Recurring revenue. Mm. So I, I'd like to keep hitting on the recurring revenue because there are businesses out there that they can develop a recurring revenue that they have not thought about. Uh, let's use an HVAC business mm. that's just servicing residential you could increase your recurring revenue by maybe having a membership program, mm. like an ongoing maintenance. There's some good companies out there, and, and we're signed up with one. And it's great. They come in you know, each season. They check on the HVAC, and we, we pay for that. But they have some additional opportunities to upsell, to increase their revenue, or they see things that 
might need attention that uh, might increase their service base with us. So there are companies out there, if you really drill down to it, there's some recurring revenue that you can develop. A buying program for a retail. You know, some of the retail out mm-hmm. there, um, like Panera Bread as an example. Mm-hmm. Look at their free drink. Um, how successful is that? $10 a month? You go in there, get your uh, soda refilled or your, your coffee, and next thing you know, you're buying another scone out there. Mm. You've just increased. So that's a recurring revenue that's coming in, and that could enhance the revenue for a business. Because mm, it kind of locks in that future stream of uh, right. revenue. You at least know a portion of that business mm-hmm. is not going to fall off. Exactly. Repeat business. You know? What about uh, strategic customers? That's probably both a blessing and a curse for a business. Yeah. Customer concentration is important. Mm-hmm. So I was uh, representing a company that all they had was a oil company is 80%. Well, that oil company goes, I mean, that's a pretty big risk. And over time, one of the suggestions I had for them, because I did represent them, but it was very hard to sell a uh, 80% customer concentration. I sell said, it to that oil company. <laughs> that's the company to sell it to, right? <laughs> right, that's true. Yeah. And uh, I did ask them, you know, diversify your customer base. But once again, they couldn't think past themselves. It's a lifestyle business for them. They ended up, unfortunately, shutting down uh, for that. They mm. did, did not increase customer base. Uh, they did not expand and they just, yeah, they made a good living at what they were doing, but it was a low hanging fruit that, uh, that they had. Mm. So that multiple you're trying to get as the seller as high as you possibly can by optimizing those things. Yeah. Customer concentration, and reducing the, And then on the, the other side, that uh, buyer's going to try to knock you down and, yeah. and give you all the reasons why it shouldn't be. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's right. All right. So, you know, kind of the final uh, step in the process, we're at the finish line, whether we're buying a business or selling the business, we've pretty much got it all done. What are the things to think about as that actual execution happens, whether that be tax or taking over a new business or moving on out of a business and, and moving into a next phase of life? You as far as a seller selling? Either. You yeah. Know, yeah. I, I might be a buyer, yeah. but, but, you know, <laughs> seller maybe down the road, but a buyer today, you know? Yeah. Well, one of the things that, that, you know, I tell people, you know, pay attention to what's happening in the market. You know, I just was talking to someone about AI um, last week. You know, there are opportunities in the AI field, but but it's still a, a puzzle today what that is. And someone would have to take a deep dive in it. And question is, can you really invest time in learning that? The people that invested time in crypto, some of those people have come and gone now. Or some mm-hmm. people have made money on that. So pay attention to what's happening in the market. And, you know, the old adage of the the people that made gold in Alaska were not people that were, were finding gold, the people that were selling tools to the gold yeah, miners yeah. and all that, as simple as, as that. Um, uh, so, so, you know, those are the kind of things I tell people. Just, just you know, I talk about there's three uh, kinds of people, people who um, watch things happen, people who wondered what happened, and people that make things happen. Mm. So be that person or be that group that is making things happen. I love it. Well, I think that's a, a pretty great place to, uh, you know, kind of bring a conclusion to this and land the plane, Emmett. Um, anything else that you want to cover in terms of the buying and selling of the business that you think people out there really need to know? Um, I think we, we have for the next four or five years, a golden opportunity mm. with retiring business owners that are ready to hand over good running businesses with good employees, with good customers, their children or family members are not, is surprisingly enough what we're finding out. Um, Like the material handling business, they have a 35-year-old son that's working in the business. He will stay, work in the business, but he does not want to be a business owner. Mm. So this is an opportunity for someone to take over a a good legacy. Um, And that's going to happen for the next four to five years. Uh, There's a good opportunity to get them financed. So you don't have to come up with a million dollars today. There's financing tools out there that uh, someone could utilize to buying a business. Um, Talk to a good advisor that's just not in it to just make a money, but uh, for sustainability, someone that has the heart to make sure it's a win-win for all sides. Mm -hmm. You're making a compelling case, one that I really haven't heard before, that if you're considering starting a business, maybe instead you go out and you buy a business that you can jump into as the owner-operator and the car's been built. Yeah, you know, it might have some rust on it, but 
you can get in there and start driving right away as exactly. opposed to you, you start in the garage and nothing's built yet. Exactly. Exactly. Good. I like That's that. Good. Well, where can people uh, find you, Emmett? Where is the best place to, to connect with you, to reach out, to pick your brain? I know you're part of tons of different organizations, <laughs> so they probably find you in a, a myriad of places, but what's the best? So the interesting thing is uh, there's a seller out, out East Ohio, and, and they have a nice fire suppression business. And, he's, he, and he Googled, uh, he wanted to do due diligence. So he Googled my name, Emmett Apollinario. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of unique. And he found a YouTube video of my presentation. So, uh, so just... Google my name. I'll, I'll, you know, I'll. It will be in the show notes. I'll, I'll show up. But uh, my email address is Emmett, and just because what I do is confidential sale for bus businesses, Emmett at confidentialsale.com. That's E M M E T, and then at confidential sale. It's singular, no s at the end. dot com. And um, you would like me to provide a phone number? <laughs> no, we'll, we'll, we'll link it. We'll link uh, sure. a ton of ways that people will uh, catch Great. up with you. Thank you. Uh, if they have questions about uh, buying a business or selling a business, I think you're making, as I stated, a compelling case that, Great. you know, if you could roll your 401k, you yeah. know, you got 80 grand in your 401k. No That's tap. not that difficult if you've been at a company for 10 or 12 years. Yeah. Maybe that could be the catalyst for you to buy a business that already has, you know, revenue coming in. And as you stated, if you have a 60 five-year-old owner, there's yeah. probably 15 things that they never did. You know, you get on those websites. I see these all the time. You're like, yeah. oh gosh, this website, you know, and you're like, well, I know what they are. You know, I know who this person is. Yeah. I can kind of paint a stereotype yeah. of this person. They're older. They don't care about the website. The yeah. website probably isn't that big of a deal for them because, well, it's not hurt us. We're still doing a million dollars a year. You know, um, there might be a big opportunity for folks out there who are thinking about uh, starting a business to instead buy a business. Yeah, I like I, that. I, I, the website is is one of the uh, one of the most fun thing that I do when I send the website of a potential business for sale to a buyer. Like we have this gentleman from St. Cloud, Minnesota. He's he's coming here in about two weekends. I gave the website of this gas equipment supplier. Well, it was not even working. We finally got it working this week, but that just shows you the opportunity of, well, you know, that's possible for this business. Yeah, one of my old bosses used to say, um, you're looking for the business with the A-level business and the C, D, or F-level management, because then you can come in and you can actually affect change, you know? <laughs> if they have a, a A-plus management and an A-plus business, well, that's going to be a premium, obviously, but you're going to get in there and be like, well, I don't know what to change, you know, <laughs> like That's true. you want to at least know what you can get in there and change right uh, right away. And I think just, just being a little younger, having a little more energy is going to be there for a lot of people. And That's enough. true. That's so, true. All right, cool. Thank you, Emmett. I appreciate you, Thank man. you. Thank you, Alex. Appreciate Happy being to have you on, man. Thank you.